I speak in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Large crowds were travelling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. The opening words of our Gospel reading, which I've just referred to, large crowds were travelling with Jesus, they highlight a phenomenon which marked most of Jesus' travelling ministry. To put it bluntly, he was a phenomenon. He was popular. Wherever he went, crowds followed him. Wherever he stopped to teach, crowds gathered around him. And of course then, as we come 2,000 or so years later and 2,000 or so miles away from that place and time, our experience of church can feel starkly different. Because we might ask, where are the crowds? Where are the crowds gathering to hear from Jesus? Nostalgia is a powerful thing. Uh, And you know, as I talk to people who are older, um, they say to me, oh, well, there used to be so many more people in church and, oh, church was full or church was nearly full. Well, by and large, in our part of the world, Church of Ireland churches were never full. Statistically, it's not possible because there just weren't enough parishioners. But nonetheless, there obviously were more people than we have now. We can say people have died. We can say people haven't come back from COVID. Whatever. It's a fact. So when we hear those words from the opening of our gospel ring, we can get discouraged. Large crowds were travelling with Jesus. But of course that is not the full story as in the second part of what I read a moment ago. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. You see Jesus was not aiming to create a quantity of disciples. Jesus was aiming to create quality of disciples. If Jesus was so interested in quantity, well then he wouldn't say things like, whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. He wouldn't say, whoever comes to me and does not hate father, mother, wife, children, brother, sister, and even life itself. If he was interested in quantity, he would not say, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Now, in the Jewish language, in the Jewish um, figure of speech, as Amelda has rightly pointed, when you say hate, it's to do with preference. In other words, you shouldn't allow your relationship with your father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, even your own life, to come between you and your relationship with Jesus. You shouldn't allow your relationship with your possessions to come between you and Jesus. But even when we kind of uh, understand it in that way, it's still strong teaching. If I was to preach that teaching week in, week out, in my own name, you'd tell me to tone it down. Probably rightly so, if I was the one saying it. But nonetheless, it is strong teaching. And that is not the kind of teaching that keeps people happy. But that's not what Jesus came for. Jesus, as he told Pontius Pilate in his trial, the reason he came, for this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Truth is a good thing, but we all know that truth can hurt at times. Maybe a family member has to have a tough conversation. Maybe it's something you don't want to hear. Maybe it's just the mirror can be a tough truth at times. Jesus came to teach the truth, rough edges and all, and quality disciples want that truth because it comes from God. What's the opposite of truth? 
a lie. We don't want lies. There's no point living in lies. We see this throughout Jesus' ministry, this contrast between the quantity and the quality. We see it at the cross itself on the first Good Friday. Where were the crowds that day? The crowds that day were the ones shouting, crucify him. And the only ones who stayed faithful at the cross were the Apostle John, Mary, his mother, and a few of the other women who had followed him. All the others were gone. But even earlier in Jesus' ministry, we could say really at the height of Jesus' ministry, we can see this working as well. John chapter 6 records the feeding of the 5,000. We may hear it this year at a harvest because it's one of the set readings for harvest this year. Um, the feeding of the 5,000. Big crowd, couldn't get a crowd larger than that. Though, of course, the 5,000 were just the men. So it's an even bigger crowd than we commonly think of. Jesus feeds the crowd and no wonder he is popular. We generally like people that fill our bellies. And they follow him. They follow him around the lake. They even follow him across the lake. Jesus is trying to get away from them and they all get in boats and they follow him across. Now, any ordinary human teacher would just bask in the admiration, would think, well, this is wonderful to be the center of attention. But Jesus says different. Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. He had the quantity, but he wanted quality. He says, don't worry just about the food. There is something more important going on here. And he goes on to speak of himself as the bread of life. The bread of life which we all need to be spiritually satisfied, to be eternally satisfied. The crowd, that gets their backs up. As anyone, if anyone locally said that, um, we'd be asking a question like this. Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Who's this young lad who we know, who's the carpenter's son? How can he say, I have come down from heaven? That would be the perfect opportunity, as Jesus is almost losing the crowd, to tone things down, to say, I didn't really mean it. It's just a symbol. It's not true. But he doesn't. He ramps it up further and further. He speaks of himself being the living bread which came down from heaven. He says that the bread that I shall give is my flesh which I shall give for the life of the world. He goes on to say, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. No wonder the crowds said This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? As we read our gospel reading today, as Imelda has shared her experience of, when we read a reading like that of Jesus speaking truth, we can be tempted to say, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? But that's the way the truth works. Sometimes the truth hurts. And what was the result of this preaching of Jesus? He had started off with a crowd of over 5,000 people. And by the end of it, about 40 verses later in John chapter 6, it says this. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Now, if Jesus was the rector and he started off with over 5,000 people in church, And by the end of it, he was left with 12. He probably would be considered a failure. But Jesus is not concerned with the quantity. He is concerned with the truth of God. There's so much in that chapter. It's 71 verses long, John chapter 6. There's so much we could talk about. I've preached on it before. There's a lot it says about Holy Communion especially. But I'm just highlighting it there today as an illustration of this concern of Jesus throughout all his ministry. And he asks his apostles who are left. There's only 12 of them left. 
and bear in mind one of them will go on to betray him, so that will be down to 11, he asks them the question, do you also want to go away? Because Jesus doesn't force anyone to do anything. It has to be our free choice. That is why when we come to baptism, when we come to confirmation, indeed when we come to communion, no one is forced. It has to be their own consent to say, yes, I want to be confirmed. Or if it's baptism in the parents' name, they're going to be brought up in the faith. Every time we come to the communion rail, there's an opportunity to say, yes, I want to be with Jesus. I don't want to go away like the rest. That leaves us in a minority. And that is why we shouldn't be discouraged necessarily when we look around and there are less people around us in church or wherever than we used to have. Because if we're with Jesus, that's all that matters. If, Je- if it's us on our own plus, Je- plus Jesus, that's a majority in God's maths. Peter answers Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus doesn't want quantity, he wants quality, and that quality is based on what Peter said. Belief in him as the Christ, the Son of the living God. Belief in his words as words of eternal life, which are true. And truth is good even when it hurts. And so at times we might be discouraged as we look around and we feel like there's very few people or we're feeling like we're we're discouraged. What does Jesus say to us? He's saying not to be concerned about the quantity, but to be concerned about our own quality. That as we deepen our discipleship, as we get closer to Jesus, that that's ultimately all that matters. And with that comes the blessings as well as the challenges of knowing him and knowing the truth of God. Large crowds were travelling with Jesus and he turned and said to them, whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And now to God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be all praise, dominion, glory and power. Forever and ever. Amen.